I'm going to start letting people in now, okay? Yeah, it sounds good.
You're on mute. Julian, you're on mute. Yep. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Uh, hello and welcome to the Cities at Tufts Colloquium, uh, along with our partners Shareable and the Kresge Foundation. I'm Professor Julian Adjaman, and together with my research assistants, Megan Tenhoff and Perry Scheinbaum, we organise Cities at Tufts as a cross-disciplinary academic initiative which recognises Tufts University as a leader in urban studies, urban planning and sustainability issues. Today we are delighted to welcome Greg Watson to be our third colloquium speaker of 2021. Uh, Greg is Director of Policy and Systems Design at the Schumacher Centre for a New Economics and his work currently focuses on community food systems and the dynamics between local and geoeconomic uh, systems. And when I was researching Greg's bio, uh, it's enough to make anybody feel like an underachiever. So I'm just going to give you a, a few snippets uh, in 1978, he organized a network of urban farmers markets in the greater Boston metropolitan area. He served as the 19th Commissioner of Agriculture in Massachusetts under Governors Dukakis and Weld from 1990 to 1993 and under Governor Deval Patrick from 2012 to 2014. And during the Patrick administration, he launched uh, a statewide urban agriculture grants program and chaired the Commonwealth's Public Market Commission, which oversaw the planning and construction of Boston's public market. From 84 to 90, uh, Greg served as the Assistant Secretary in the Massachusetts Executive Office of uh, Economic Affairs, where he established and chaired the Massachusetts Office of Science and Technology. He's got hands-on experience of organic farming, aquaculture, wind energy technology, passive solar design, when he was at the New Alchemy Institute on Cape Cod, first as its education director and then as executive director. He's been um, executive director of Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, one of my uh, fantastic favorite all-time uh, Boston-based organizations. And he served under President Obama's uh, transition team um, in the US Department of Energy in 2008. Greg's talk today is organizing for food secure, uh, food sovereignty in Boston, a personal history. Greg, a Zoom-tastic welcome to the Cities at Tufts colloquium. Thank you so much, Julian. And, and it should be obvious to everyone, as I think I said to you earlier, I have a difficult time holding on to steady employment, so I will attribute it to that. Um, I am going to immediately switch to my presentation, and although it's called a personal um, history, you'll quickly see it's, it's far from that. It's really about an incredible network of, um, of folks. And if I can find that um, presentation, I had it earlier. And now it doesn't seem to want to pop up there. Can folks, oh, here we go. There we are. I just wanted to kind of keep you hanging there for a little bit. So let's, let's get into it. Um, I, I want to start by just talking about the politics of um, growing food. And in the mid to late 70s, it became a, a, a very public topic. Um, and this was the front page of a local weekly called The Real Paper back in 1978, and it is about the, po the politics of growing food in Massachusetts. Um, this, oops, now we really are, it's still not going to do this for me, is it? There we go. Um, there's a history of growing food in the city of Boston dates back to World War II. Um, we had our own share of Victory Gardens, the Fens is I think probably the most uh, known instance of our um, Victory Gardens, about seven and a half acres, over 500 gardens, but there are also um, Victory Gardens in downtown Boston, in this case, uh, Copley Square. Um, it's sort of ironic that right at the end, or immediately after the end of the Second World War, even with the proliferation of uh, Victory Gardens, the overall agricultural sector in Massachusetts began a serious decline. Um, from the end of the Second World War, right up until the mid-1970s, Massachusetts was showing an alarming deterioration of both farms and farmland. That's the graph, two graphs on your left. And it prompted um, the, the, the 
commissioner of agriculture at that time, Fred Winthrop, to establish a blue ribbon commission to try to figure out what could be done to um, stave off the loss of farms and farmland in Massachusetts. Let me just say there was a pretty, there was a sentiment at that time that maybe that was inevitable that Massachusetts would, uh, you know, sort of focus on, should focus on its high tech industries and its colleges and universities. And maybe it was an inevitability that we would not be a farming state. Fortunately, Fred Winthrop and the Blue Ribbon Commission he came up with didn't feel that way and came up with some alternatives about what we could do. Um, this real paper article, just want to give you a synopsis, does talk about where the public sentiment was. And again, this is back in 1978. Um, we were importing 95, maybe 98% of our food um, from out of state. It's not a whole lot better these days, but this was enough to create, uh, sound the alarms to say we should do whatever we can to sort of stave it off. And here's what's interesting. Um, during that period, in the aftermath of the policy for food and agriculture that came from the um, Blue Ribbon Commission, that was, a, that was a product of the Blue Ribbon Commission, suggested a number of um, options that the state could um, undertake. All of them, the, all of them within the realm of state um, powers. They wanted the report not to sort of speculate on what might come from the feds, whatever. They really said, let's look at the, uh, the strategies that were available within our state boundaries. And interestingly enough, the number one major advocate for agriculture in the state legislature during those years was Mel King, state legislator from the South End. Um, I say surprising, and most folks thought it was surprising at the time, obviously, because Matt Mel was, as you can see, African-American, and folks couldn't understand at first why he was so passionate about agriculture to the point where one of his colleagues did ask him that, on the um, on the legislature, the floor of the legislature, and they asked Mel, "Why are you so interested in agriculture?" Mel's response was, um, "Because I eat." Um, Mel was an is is Mel still very much active and still very much alive. Um, he, he embodied um, sort of the whole rainbow coalition mentality in terms of em embracing everyone and creating the most diverse network of people possible to solve problems. Um, he was genuine, um, passionate, um, visionary, um, gentle, um, could be angered. Um, he um, knew how to involve people. When he ran for mayor against Ray Flynn back in, in, the, in the late 70s, or I think it was in the 70s, um, he, um, his, he never asked his supporters for cash. He got us to get involved with this campaign by holding house parties, making cream cheese sandwiches, or in this case, because he knew I was a cartoonist, asked me if I could design his campaign. Well, he did raise some money, his campaign um, um, envelope. The major organization at that time, as far as um, food production in the city um, and food sovereignty was the Boston Urban Gardeners, or BUG for short. And, and the Boston Urban Gardeners bug is where I really got my introduction to community organizing. Um, it was, a, 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 again, just like uh, Mel, very embracing an, an organization that was very diverse, women-led and actually white-led organization, which in some cases, in terms of some models of organizing, some folks um, would have or take issues with. And the case of... Um, Boston and the uh, Mel King and those of us who were uh, members of the Boston Urban Gardeners, not an issue at all. What we were looking for was commitment, uh, uh, management skills, passion, and an understanding, really even back then, of systems. The woman in the center on the left there, Charlotte Kahn, she along with Judy Wagner were the um, the founders, co-founders of Boston Urban Gardeners. I'm going to not point out everybody in the in the photo, but in the upper left-hand corner there, the woman who said you can just sort of see peeping over the top there, her name is Susan Rudlick. And Susan at the time was um, director of agricultural land use in Massachusetts. Bug really had a very small, I think really Judy and Charlotte were sort of the the, 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 the paid staff with maybe a few others, it was a vast network. They got everybody to sort of participate that was interested in urban gardens and urban food production. This was sort of the funky office that, that they occupied after they merged with the Southwest Corridor Farm. So you can see it was not necessarily a 
high, um, didn't have a, a, a huge budget. Um, what they did with the money they got was pretty amazing though. Uh, they, they took advantage of resources. Back then we had something called, we had the Waltham Field Station, um, the, 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 uh, which provided technical assistance and advice to urban gardeners, specifically to urban gardeners. And so it focused on issues like lead and soil, things that we could not have gotten from the Agricultural Extension Service, or maybe not as much from the Agricultural Extension Service out in Amherst. Um, an incredible resource. The, the extension service is gone, but the Waltham Center is still there with about eight nonprofits. I think they're in some amazing organizations that you should all know about. Um, the um, approach to getting things done by Bug was um, pretty incredible. Um, sometimes the tactics were outrageous and aud uh, audacious, but they understood the current political and cultural environment and they knew what they could do they knew how far they could push. In this case, for instance, they needed, we were always in need of soil, and that's still the case in many urban, uh, I guess pretty much in all urban um, environments these days because of soil contamination, lead, um, the amounts of lead that there, and because in most cases, people don't even really know what type of contamination there is because there's a record of illegal dumping, or at least a knowledge of illegal dumping that's gone on for decades. So you know, either barriers, bringing in composting, new soil was always a challenge when Judy, and in this case, I think Charlotte, Charlotte Kahn learned about a project at the University of Massachusetts, Worcester. I think it actually was the Worcester Biotech Park. And they realized there was just this, I uh, excuse the typo there, but 5,000 cubic yards of topsoil. They w were anxious to see how they could get it. And they were able to recruit the US Army um, 6, 642nd Battalion to haul the topsoil from Worcester to Boston. You probably couldn't do that today. Um, today, if you tried to do that, we would get all the negative headlines about, you know, you know the uh, abuse of, of use of, of, of the military, whatever. There were a bunch of reasons why you couldn't go, do it today. The lessons that we learn as we organize with BUG is that there are special cases, in this case, a special case is, is the topsoil from Worcester and using the, the, the reserve. Um, but the lessons learned there is uh, understand your environment, understand the context, and know what's possible in terms of the options available to you. By the way, the, the gentleman down in that right uh, photograph on the right there, that's John Kerry, uh, our new uh, 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 climate change czar um, in the administration. Back then, he was lieutenant governor for in Massachusetts, um, actually, and um, it just sort of gives a sense of the breadth and depth of the network that um, Bug established to kind of get things done. And again, here's Susan Redlick, who was the, the director of the Division of Agricultural Land Use, a state bureaucrat. The gentleman here is Jack Powers, a poet. He owns Stone Soup poet, uh, Poetry Shop, a bookstore in, on Charles Street. These were the people that worked for Bug and got Bug's work done. They're shown here providing coffee and sandwiches to these um, folks who hauled the topsoil from Worcester to Boston. Um, personal contact, networking, and critical to everything that, we, that Bug did um, back then, no, no virtual venues. And I will say that there's a, I'm still sort of trying to figure out the pros and cons. Obviously, we've got a lot of advantages in being able to take uh, use technologies like this, Zoom, especially in this particular era. Um, but there is also something to be said about that person-to-person -person contact that Bug epitomized. Um, we, uh, as you can see, maybe not uh, from this letter, this was a, 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 an, a, a, an encouraging letter from the city of Boston um, that said that spaces were made available to create a uh, community gardens for um, the city of Boston. If you look down the last paragraph, um, they stressed the work had just begun. They had to put together a plan, a neighborhood open space land trust plan. Land trusts are really integral to both community gardens and urban agriculture movement, and actually for a lot of the work we do at Schumacher. Um, you can see from this that the bug wasted no time and that, um, I think it was October of 89 that they got the letter in February of 1990, they came up with this um, open space uh, plan for a neighborhood open space land trust. 
uh, and th the skills, and again, the network and the, the work that was done to me suggests that there's also a lot to be gained by having to go through the struggle. There is always sort of an argument, well, you know, why aren't there, I, I have a comparison with some programs in the UK where there's an allotment program where citizens are given the opportunity to uh, rent land and it's open to, uh, to, uh, available to everyone. I, I think that's good, but if, if that, type of, that type of program doesn't address the systemic problems and doesn't lead to systemic change, and if there are systemic problems that we're trying to address, some, my feeling is sometimes we're better off um, going through the struggle and learning what it is that we can do. You can sort of see the celebrations were always a part of what we um, did there. We wanted to let people know when there were successes. I think that's sometimes one of the problems we have is that we don't, we work hard um, when you're part of a cult struggle. Um, we don't, these days, I'm not sure we celebrate enough and uh, help people understand um, and acknowledge the success of their work. Here's that guy again, Mel King. Um, this time it, it's just highlighting the fact that he also, among other things, I mentioned um, um, uh, working to preserve agricultural land, taking that policy for food and agriculture and implementing it through policies in the state legislature. He started a statewide fruition program. I call him sort of our original permaculturalist. There are orchards planted around, not just in Boston, they're around the state. They're as far as, as, far west as Amherst, I believe, but they're also just a, a line of a, a, a bunch of uh, fruit and nut trees in the city of Boston. That was the, the positive part. One of the things we did learn though, is that um, trying to create sort of the management and continuity of those, those trees and orchards would require a lot of care. There wasn't an organization that was in place. So many of them uh, went unharvested. And then as you probably know with fruit and nut trees, that can become a nuisance as well. When you start having fruit, um, I've got, you know, your cars or anything, that can, be, that can be an issue. But anyway, this was published in the Boston Globe. And the idea was they wanted not only to highlight the fact this had been done, but they wanted the community to know where they might be able to go out and maybe perhaps adopt some of the trees that had been planted as part of the fruition program. Um, in 1977, I was working on Thompson Island um, at, at Thompson Island Education Center. I was teaching as part of South Boston's uh, forced busing to integrate schools back then. Pretty dicey, back and forth on, on a boat. One, one day I'm on the uh, boat coming home and Susan Redlick, the woman I pointed out in the upper left-hand corner of the Boston Urban Gardeners picture, uh, she, we knew each other through Bug, had never worked together, but she took the boat over and rode back with me and asked if I would be interested in organizing farmers markets in Boston. Mel King had procured some money from the legislature to hire a part-time consultant. And I'm not sure why Susan chose me, but I guess we, we looked at our interactions and, and, and all, and she asked me if I'd be interested. I looked at her and said, I, I think so, Susan, tell me what a farmer's market is. And she described it. And I said, yep, I, I, I will do that. I was working part-time um, at Thompson Island. We, um, I was able to recruit an intern from Buckingham, Brown, and Nichols, um, who happened to be visiting Thompson Island a few weeks before. I'm not making any of this up. High school senior. He called me about three days after I accepted this. He said, uh, I met you on the tour. I'm a senior. We have to do a senior project. Is there anything that I can do for you? I said, absolutely. He came on board and we organized the markets. The first one opened up, never forget, July 8th, 1978, um, uh, Fields Corner in Dorchester. And I bring this up because it sort of speaks to, and by the way, this was really important to Mel King because he, he was interested in as part of this whole, I, at this point it was a movement. I'm not sure it was a system. I'm not sure it was a vision, but it certainly was a movement and inspired by Mel to increase our uh, ability to, to meet more and more and more of our food needs. He never talked about sufficiency, but he did talk about how much is it realistic to talk about a stone. He said, if we can get 10 or 20% more, that's, that's pretty, pretty major. But he also saw it as a way of building urban rural coalitions because he realized there's only so much you can do statewide, even with, with rural farms. And there's only, and even more limited in terms of what we could do um, as urban farmers, but working together, we could help each other. And he also realized that by building that kind of coalition, you could build urban support for legislation that was for farmers, for legislation relevant to farms 
um, were, but farmers had obviously not the numbers that we had in the city. So it was a sort of a win-win. That, that first farmer's market, I will point out though, that we got um, commitments from 20 farmers uh, to show up in Dorchester on that Saturday morning. We had the commissioner of agriculture, we had TV show, we had everything there. And uh, at nine o'clock when the market opened, not a single farmer showed up. And we were, and the crowds were there. 9.30, this one catchy barbarian from, from Northboro showed up. Um, he couldn't unload his truck fast enough because he, he sold out. That evening, the TV cameras, rather than taking a wide angle shot, showing one farmer in the middle of the street, did a close up. And all you could see were hands exchanging fruits and vegetables and money. And the next week we had 20 farmers and the thing took off. And by the way, that's catchy on the left in 1978. And in 2010, he was still selling at farmer's markets in Brookline, so it, it really did make a difference. I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of uh, uh, um, detail here because we're, I'm getting a little short on time, but over the years, we're realizing that the, I'll, I'll use the term here, the, the markets have become sort of gentrified. Um, then, and with the introduction of, of incentive programs to encourage low-income people to buy fresh fruits and vegetables at farmer's markets, like the HIP program and WIC and SNAP, um, we're finding there's some tension between sort of the affluent customers who are more what I would sort of just the, the more affluent and mostly white uh, customers being impatient with the new influx of low income customers who held up the lines because they needed the coupons or they didn't speak English. And there was just a lot of tension. So we held a workshop recently to try to look at how we could reinstill the culture of inclusion um, at, at markets. Um, this is basically, once again, an observation. It just says that things evolve. And as, as programs become popular and evolve over time, we've got to be flexible as organizers to try to figure out how we can um, adapt to that. In 1980, I um, was visiting, once again, Susan Redlick in her office at the Saltonstall building to return a film that I was showing to a group of students. I was then teaching at the Charles River Academy in Cambridge. As I was getting on the elevator, she ran up to me, called out my name, handed me a piece of paper and it was a job announcement to become education director at this place called the New Alchemy Institute on Cape Cod. Um, no internet back then. I looked with the library, looked it up. Um, we looked at each other, my, my family and all, and they said, looks like a commune. And I said, no, I think they're doing some like really exciting work. And uh, I applied and I went. And I felt like at the time that I was abandoning my, all, all the network and friends not only at, at Boston Urban Gardeners, but I was also abdicate, leaving the city. And so I kind of felt down about that. And I expressed those concerns to Mel King. And of course, um, I should have known, but as soon as I, shortly after I got settled at New Alchemy, one of the first groups that I led a tour for were Mel King's community fellows. He brought them out to, uh, down to the Cape, <laughs> drove them down there, said, take them for a tour, we looked at geodesic domes and Cape Cod arcs and fish farms. And Mel looked at me and I, I said, Mel, well, I, and he said, this was my first field trip for these folks. And I said, why? And he says, I want them to see what's possible. And I want them to see that some things are possible that they didn't even, they don't even know about, didn't even think about, because that's the way we're going to get them thinking beyond um, and getting them to think in terms of really understanding all the options are available to them. And lo and behold, later on at, at places like Dudley Street, we were able to take these concepts and to put them in place. So when I got the opportunity to um, become executive director at the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, um, I, I, I will say of, of all the things that I've done, I, I, I feel now in retrospect that um, the four I, I should have paid the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative for the four years I spent there because it was like getting a, a graduate degree in life. It was just an amazing place. The things they had to, to deal with and overcome. Uh, if people don't know the story, I suggest you read Streets of Hope by Holly Sklar and Peter Medoff. It's a history of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. Um, the, the capsule thing is that uh, it, multicultural neighborhood, Cape Verdean, Latino, African-American, white, poor, right in the heart of Boston, uh, Dorchester, Roxbury. Um, they, the community was able to halt urban renewal efforts that the city had in mind for them that was gonna have marinas and condominiums and the neighbors all looked at each other and said, we don't see ourselves in that scenario What this is gonna be another, again, back in those days, urban renewal was, was called Negro removal. 
and they could see themselves being displaced by that. That's the whole gentrification displacement piece. They halted the, um, the, 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 um, the, the, the urban renewal effort. Um, Mayor Ray Flynn, who was, who defeated Mel King as for mayor way back when with the envelope. So he felt, and, but, and, and Ray Flynn, I think to some extent felt that he had lost sort of support of a lot of the minority community. So he, he did say to folks, uh, to the community, tell me what you need and whatever it is you need, I will get it for you. Do you to clean up? Oh, sorry. Back up one point here. After halting the urban renewal, the slum lords and speculators who had bought up land and tenements and did nothing with them, they were waiting for the city to come in and buy so that they could obviously profit from it. And when they saw that it might not happen, at least the slum lords basically responded by torching their buildings to collect insurance. So night after night, there were fires. Uh, the, the neighborhood was reduced to 1,400 vacant burned out lots. And that's when the point where the, when, when Mayor Ray Flynn said, what can I do to help the, in consultation with lawyers and urban planners, the community um, asked for the power of eminent domain over all abandoned vacant land. And that was granted. They had land, I won't go into all the details, but it was a major, first time, only time, a nonprofit um, grassroots organization was given that power. And they didn't take it lightly. There were, there were long arguments about what are we going to do with that type of power? That's the power that governments use to to force people off their land, or that take land, towns and and destroy them to create the Quabbin Reservoir, so that Boston can have water. What in the world are we going to do with that? But they decided they would set up a form of self governance, and they would use it to rebuild their neighborhood. Um, they went through a number of processes. They went through visioning processes that. that that talked about affordable housing, the types of housing that they were looking for. And I got to tell you, it is the best kept secret. It's not a secret, but if you don't know about how this community, um, in some cases, turned traditional planning on its head and, and rebuilt itself, you've got to do it. And it's also, once again, a testament to the power of organizing and the synergy of, of getting people together and organizing um, toward a po to a positive vision not against something, but for something. And I will tell you though, that sustaining that positive organizing uh, initiative is a lot tougher than, than it is mobilizing people to fight, to fight, to fight, because it sort of, you can always see what you're, you know, what it is you're trying to, at least in some cases, what your, what, who your enemy is. And we would get into some arguments with the conventional organizing schools, like the Industrial Areas Foundation, who kind of like had some issues with that. But one of the, it's interesting, one of the first initiatives, or one, not the first, when I got there, the initiative that after housing, economic development was sort of a goal, and urban agriculture was one of the things that was on their plate. Youth were always involved, and that was one of the things that Mel always stressed. You got to get the youth involved. They've got to understand this. Youth here are building a, a physical model of our neighborhood street by street. I think it was one of the first times that that a big 3D printer, and I think it was Caesar McDowell at MIT, that, that allowed us to use this 3D printer that was the size of a, of a, of a small apartment and that was that huge, but, and that's where you got these little sort of models out, but that, that built an, um, a sense of belonging, a sense of pride for these young people. And by the way, there's a, a town common that was part of the redevelopment strategy, the revitalization strategy for Dudley Street that also became the site for the farmer's markets um, that were held weekly. I'll get to that in just a second. Before that, it was a site where um, drug dealing and prostitution happened, at least where they were solicited. And when the, um, when the architects who were hired, uh, John Copley and Lynn Wolf, who organized this, they said, we wanna interview the kids and we want, we want the youth to design that uh, um, square so that it can, the, the town common, so that it will actually get used, and it has been successful. One of the first, the, the keystone to our urban agriculture program, to a large extent, was a greenhouse. And let me just show you, this is the evolution of that greenhouse. It's a Brook Avenue garage, was an abandoned garage, it was an automobile repair shop, um, it leaked a lot of oil. The Massachusetts Highway Department had money through its environmental supplemental, pro supplemental program that was made available to um, distressed communities in Boston 
that could somehow make a relationship between polluted land and oil and because they had to be some relationship. And so we had this site and we said the Brook Avenue garage held a number of meetings. Um, so the community, what, what are we going to do with this? Some people su propose, let's put a park in there. We want more open space. There are a number of options, but we finally arrived at no, the, let's build a greenhouse. And we looked at, there's another shot of the garage. Um, well, we, we got the money. You can see here the demolition started. That's a, a view of the site from our office at the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. Um, and there, if you look at almost at the center, that thing looks like somebody had just like dropped a spaceship down in the middle of our neighborhood. But that's the, that's, that's the greenhouse. Um, um, we partner with the food project. This is another view of it. And once again, it's built with, a, with our partner organization, the Dudley Neighbors Incorporated, the Land Trust. And, and it's just important to stress, I've been going through a lot of things very quickly and just about ready to end, but the whole idea is that the community owned the land. And, and when, even with the housing, the community, it's a community land trust, they own the land and you lease the land for 99 years. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that. Maybe that'll come up during Q and A. It was a difficult argument for a lot of folks, some of our Latino and, and African-American uh, residents say, what do you mean I don't own the land? That's the source of wealth. That's how you start to build wealth. Well, what do you, and so we had to have this conversation about how we felt that the community land trust was a tool that would help um, avoid speculation. Because it would, well, on one hand, we wanted economic, the residents wanted economic development. On the other hand, they feared economic development and improvement because they saw that scenario of gentrification and displacement sort of playing itself out and they did not know how to avoid it. And I will say that, that the Community Land Trust at least uh, certainly has been the answer for Dudley Street. And there's a, another shot of the, that's the in, inside of the greenhouse, 10,000 square feet. Um, it rented out, I think 200 residents a year apply and they grow so they can get fresh vegetables in the winter. Food Project, an incredible partner in this, um, they manage the not uh, not only the 10,000 square foot greenhouse, but they also manage uh, the food lots, outdoor lot uh, plots, and they they teach our residents how to farm. And, and I do think that urban agriculture, among other things, is going to be a place where a lot of our future farmers in the state are going to be um, trained to become farmers. Uh, this is just a shot of a, a 2000, I think a 2013 uh, Boston Globe um, piece of uh, taking root, talking about uh, what's happening in the city and how the city is now sprouting all these urban farming initiatives. So we sort of came full circle. I'm talking about gestation period. This is a diagram uh, by, developed by Penn Low, most of you probably know, in the urban environment policy and planning at Tufts. And it really talks about sort of the first articulation of sort of the, uh, a closed loop system for urban agriculture. And Penn and his group have just done amazing things in the urban environment program. But I think this was a way of sort of talking about how we can improve the environment, encourage, open, um, create open space, and um, uh, also promote economic development. I will say, as, as I think Penn stresses in the solidarity economy sort of writings and, and, and discussions, that we do need a new economic context for this. These aren't all going to be your traditional profitable businesses. They contribute a lot more to the community, and somehow we got to factor in and understand how we integrate certain types of initiatives like this so that we achieve the overall goals that we're trying to, uh, to meet. Um, I will say that the other thing that's happened, the city of Boston, uh, Mayor Menino, very supportive. Um, uh, we work with uh, um, uh, John Fuerbach at the Department of Neighborhood Development. I think it was two years when I came back from my second tour as Commissioner of Agriculture. And this is pretty amazing because this is how you start to create systemic change. We can do the markets and we can do the the gardens and the urban farms, but how do you codify that? And what Mayor Menino committed to, and to all of us, I said, we're now gonna um, rezone the city of Boston to permit commercial farming. And that's major, because if it's not in the code, if it's not in the zoning code, you may as well forget, it doesn't really exist. And so this, I, I don't know if we were the first, but we certainly were among the first cities to actually zone for agriculture. And it was two years because you had to consider every single detail. What would you encounter? I mean, it was composting on roofs to, you know, the size of lots. So it was an arduous, it was sometimes painful, 
um, but it was also incredibly educational. Just about the, um, just want to point out as one of the, so as us old fogies are slowly fading into the, uh, into the twilight, the most encouraging thing is it's just this, this bunch of young um, and energetic urban farmers that are on the scene. These are folks from the Urban Farming Institute uh, in Boston. They've, uh, they've, they've now got the, the Clark Fowler Farm, which was a, Mattapan was a farm back in the day. Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan was agricultural back in the days, right? Because Boston, there was a pretty good distance to travel. And so there was a lot of good farmland and they are doing some of the most incredible work in the, in the city. Um, I'm gonna end by talking about the future. There are still, there are gonna be some high tech innovations that are out there. Um, climate controlled environments like freight farms and greenhouses are, are, are gonna be probably needed, unfortunately, if, if we don't abate climate change the way that we know that we're gonna need to. Rooftops, this is um, uh, again, taking advantage of, in many cases, of unused um, or not, well, certainly unused, but also not contested space that's on the ground. Boston has got some real, obviously there's a lot of um, competition for land on the ground. Uh, there's some particular interesting issues that we hadn't realized in terms of wind and other things there. Um, and this was uh, Boston Medical Center also doing something similar. So um, concern there though, is that once again, you've got now a lot of highly capitalized young people coming in and, and doing what they should do. They should take advantage of what has been done, particularly the zoning and all, so that and encourage entrepreneurial activities in the city. Um, but we, gotta, we wanna make sure that it doesn't inadvertently push out the folks who were the pioneers and are doing some of the more conventional farming um, in the city. Um, I'm gonna end by making a plug. If people are interested in community land trust for further discussion, we're gonna be having a round table tomorrow sponsored by the Schumacher Center. So that's, that's coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, the Massachusetts Urban Farming Conference is, and that's a joint venture, the Urban Farming Institute and Mass Department of Agricultural Resources, an incredible lineup of folks that are gonna be there. So if you want to delve deeply, more deeply into community land trust, urban farming, that's there. I'm going to end with uh, this quote. Um, this is how you can get in touch with me if you're interested, uh, Center for Economic Development. And I will sort of say, yes, we should all do it the Mel King way. Greg, thank you for a fascinating uh, tour through um, urban agriculture in Boston. and. You know what a role you've had to play, and uh, Greg, you're not an old fogey. <laughs> you're a. <laughs> but but as you can see, I'm serious though. It really is an incredible network of and diverse network of un unbelievable people. Absolutely. Well, listen, we've got some great questions coming up. Um, but first one, Greg, I want to ask you, what does food sovereignty mean to you? You know, we've got all these academic kind of ideas of what, but you know, in a, in a sentence or two, what does food sovereignty mean to you? To me, it means a strategy for meeting food needs that's developed by the community. Uh, and, and so you sort of separate food security can, can also do that, but it can do it in ways that don't acknowledge or um, sort of the, how the community benefits from the strategies to, to, to do it. So it's, it's really focusing attention, not entirely, but certainly making sure that the input from the community and the community involvement, like urban farms, for instance, and all are factored into our ways of thinking about meeting future food needs. Right, okay. Okay, we've got some student questions. Anna Burry wants to know, can you say more about maintaining positive energy in the neighborhood and around different initiatives? Um, you know, have you, what have you seen of this? Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you know, and that's why it's sort of interesting. This, the visioning process that was supported by the, in this case, I think it was the Annie E. Casey Foundation. And the Annie E. Casey Foundation came in and it wasn't just Dudley Street. There were about four other communities, Washington, D.C., um, I forget, Detroit. There were, again, community, community organizing organizations. And they gave us like six years of money to plan and vision. The vi so the, the idea there is, can you, is it truly possible to come up with a shared vision that the community says, this is us, and this is, we know what we're aiming for, and we're driven by that. And then also, because you didn't have the milestones. And that's why, for instance, it was so important when we talked about economic development and urban agriculture became one of those, those concepts, that getting that greenhouse built, 
getting the food project to play its role in making that happen became a tangible, right? A, a real tangible sign that we were moving towards that. Same with the, and, and, and prior to that, well before I got there, the housing was, was part of it. So they, and you, you could see the, that when that housing sort of took place. So it really is keeping your, I'll, I'll use the cliche, being able to keep your eye on the prize, but being sustained by positive feedback because you can see the progress being made. Great, thanks Greg. Uh, Jessica Brennan asks if you could speak more a, li a little bit more about the report you mentioned on farmers markets and cultural inclusivity. I know this is of great interest to a lot of students, especially students in my food justice class. Yeah, uh, ab Absolutely, and I will say I give so much credit to the Massachusetts uh, Food Policy um, Collaborative, um, uh, Winton Pitkoff. Uh, basically, they decided we need to do something to, um, is it possible, first of all, to get a couple of groups together, vendors, and uh, we were looking for both vendors and market managers, and help us explain what the problem is. And so we, we got their observations about, uh, again, sort of the, the, the jams that were created because you were having to use a new technology. There, there was particular concern about, you know, the, um, the, the customers who needed translation, translation, because that, again, sort of ball things up. So we kind of said, all right, are, is there a toolkit we could put together? Are there enough, are there enough problems that seem to be common that if we could address signage, for instance, I mean, some, some simple things that, that, that in different languages, uh, outreach to communities and that sort of thing. So what we did is we held two, um, one Eastern Mass and one Western Mass, workshop that I facilitated and we did SWOT analyses. We did a bunch of things. We interviewed in between, right? Got lots of feedback. And then we put together not just the report, but we put together a toolkit. Things that, and, and the, the audience for this primarily, well, the primary audience were market managers and vendors, but also, you know, we want consumers that they were interested in reading it. And so it is available um, at the Mass Food Co um, uh, System Collaborative. Uh, at their website, or if people want to get just touch, in touch with me directly, can also send it to them. Great, thanks, Greg. Uh, Greg, one question that, that I have as well. Um, you know, my theory, and I don't think it's uh, necessarily mine, but DSNI, as I understand it, before they constituted the um, the organisation, the board, they looked at the demographics of the neighbourhood and tried to mirror the demographics of the neighbourhood. Uh, in the board and, and in the organization itself. So, um, I mean, simple question, is that why they are so effective, legitimate, trusted? Yeah, I, I think so. Let me, let me say this, and it, it, it's a commitment to, to a honoring a process. And here's the, the other thing is Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, the actual um, boundaries are not an official uh, census boundary. They are, it, it's sort of like, this is what the community, the community says, this is our neighborhood. So even when we did reports, we had to jerry rig that. And I was there for four years, 30 member board of directors, Cape Verdean, Latino, African-American, uh, white, but then the churches, the, 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 the community development corporations, the businesses all could have a representation on the board. Um, and by the way, and the board is elected. It's not appointed. I mean, it's, it's a neighborhood-wide election. They advertise and campaign with, with televisions in the, in, in the window of, of Dudley Street. The election is held at St. Patrick's Church. It's monitored. <laughs> I mean, it's like the real deal. And, and, and then you, the work is done by committees, right? I mean, it, and, and so in four years, think about this, four years, the first Wednesday of every month, a 30-member board meeting and never once was there an issue of a quorum, ever. Because the other thing was that, that people knew that what they were doing was going to really have an impact on their lives. So it was that representation, true representation. And um, I, I think that sort of transparency went a long way. And by the way, that didn't mean, <laughs> as you well know, that there weren't some real heated arguments and knock down, drag out fights. But even those, the way that they got resolved, really appreciated by the community. I don't, I don't think there's any question. And by the way, long before I got there, this was people like Gus Newport and, and Peter Medoff and folks who really cranked a lot of this stuff out. And, and the community. I mean, uh, Shea Madgen and others who really were the, the linchpin for all this. 
Great, thanks, Greg. Uh, Rachel Brunner wants to know, um, or wants a clarification of whether the land trust owned the land or if residents were able to purchase land through the land trust. And can you expand on how this increased community wealth through land ownership? It's, the, it's, it's community owned. So there's a Dudley Neighbors Incorporated and that's the, that is the community land trust. And, and the residents own their homes. They have a 99 year lease. And the reason for that, and one of the things that that allowed the, the organization to do is, for instance, it could, as a, as a land trust, we could cap the amount of, um, and this one could be controversial, but we could cap the, the amount of profit that could be made on the resale of your property within a certain time frame. And, and the reason for doing that is we felt that if you could do that, if you could come up with a way that, 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 the, that the value of the property was going to increase but not be maximized. We call it optimizing the value of the land to achieve our goals so that a speculator, someone who could say, well, these are really good homes and they, they're built fairly cheap. If I, I can buy these things up, I'm gonna sell them. You know, you know, and then that's where, the, that's where the displacement comes in. And so the land trust, you, you've got to get this sort of agreement that, that we're going to manage um, the land lease and do it for the benefit. Here's, here's, here's the goal. We can't guarantee um, that every landowner will um, maximize your property. We can optimize and guarantee the integrity of the community. At least that's, that's the thinking. So it's community first and that's what the land trust comes in, but it does take some, uh, you know, and, and, but it all, and it speaks to very one important point, And that is that, that we were asking, the, the members of society who had the least opportunity to build wealth, right, to, to take and not maximize that for the benefit of the community, but they were more than willing to do that. So there was an additional sacrifice you're asking them to make, but not doing so runs the risk that um, your worst fears are going to be met. Okay, thanks, Greg. Uh, Josh McAlinden wants to know a little bit about this agroecology work that you've done uh, in Cuba. Um, and his question is really, can you share insights in achieving food sovereignty uh, in that country versus here in a capitalist nation? Yeah, I'll be really quick, but it's very interesting. We did a, it, it's a matter of fact, I was actually, it was my last year as commissioner of agriculture, the second time, and I was on the board of the Schumacher Center. So um, we were, uh, and I had just established our urban agriculture program, our grants program for the state. And one of the board members of Schumacher said, well, that, that's very exciting. What are the best examples of successful urban agriculture? And my son, who was a self-taught um, uh, expert on Cuba, said, dad, you got to tell him, got to go, gotta go to Cuba. So I, I didn't say that. I said, it's in Cuba. Next thing I know, we, get a, we did put together a delegation. And we go to Cuba to look at their food system, not just the, we looked at agroecology. But here's the interesting thing. I'm glad the question was asked. So we went to see what are they doing? And as we went and we brought a bunch of people with us, they looked and saw what they were doing from the growing part, the production part, wasn't really that different. I mean, they were certainly organic composting. They were permaculture oil. As you, if you, people who are familiar with it know, but and this, they they didn't adopt um, sort of the agroecology or ecological ecology uh, from an ideology ideology point of view or in protest of fossil fuels. They did it because they had to, right? Russia cut off. All, I mean, right? Everything was gone. They had no oil, and they said we're going to, and they were starving. Fifteen pounds or twenty pounds of weight loss per year during that difficult period. Uh, so they adopted this, and it worked. But what we found, what the, what the African-American visitors on the delegation found, it was the organization. It was the cooperative uh, arrangement. It was the fact that the um, farmer to farmer information sharing. So there were some organizational and structural parts combined with the technical parts of agriculture that to them sort of said, this is why it works because of the, the, the whole package. Uh, and also because of the commitment um, and the, necessity. That's why I kind of come back even to the struggle here. The struggle means you're going to try to find answers that you couldn't have found elsewhere. But it's a, if, if people are interested in that, you contact me. We have a couple of reports that came out of our um, three or four trips uh, to Cuba, and there still is an agroecology network going. Great. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Melissa Gordon asks, can you tell us a little bit about your, uh, a little bit more about your experience as agric uh, agriculture commissioner? 
and she her specific question is um what role can uh, people like you in those governmental positions of power play in advancing food justice well that's a good a good question i will say now this is interesting in my first tenure right that was in 1993 i got caught up in something that probably will be a little bit surprising because i was approached by dairy farmers in the state who felt that they were going out of business because they were locked into this thing called the federal milk marketing order where they had no control over how much they could charge for the milk because the price of milk, I don't know if folks realize that is regulated by the federal government. And the, 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 the amount that you, that is charged is based on a formula that nobody, I, there are more people at MIT that understand, um, there are more people in the world that understand quantum physics, the theory, theory of strings and whatever that understand how milk is priced because you cannot figure it out. It's price of block cheese in Wisconsin, your distance from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, but the fact of the matter was, it had nothing to do with the cost of production in Massachusetts. Long and short of that first time around, we actually challenged a federal milk marketing order. Um, and we got all the way to the Supreme Court where we lost. Um, but what we came up with really would have helped the dairy farmers. In terms of, in terms of justice, I think in, in, in environmental justice, I think one of the things that we can do, and it's being done now, wasn't we started it when I was there, but now Rosa Ruda has really taken it, and that is access to land. I mean, you know, 98% of the agricultural land in the United States is owned by whites. And, and it used to be a lot more blacks on land, but they were cheated out of, swindled, duped out of the land to the point now where it's just, again, and that, no matter how you look at it, land is the source of wealth. So if you want to start talking about that, and, but also addressing issues about whatever you, food desert. I have a friend, Karen Washington, a farmer in New York. She goes, she doesn't like food desert. She calls it food apartheid. She said, desert sounds like it's a natural phenomenon. This is not anything but, but, but that. So I think those are the sort of things when you think about growing your own nearer to the source, farmer's markets, that sort of thing, but also land access, I think starts to get at some of those issues of um, economic and environmental justice. Great. Thanks, Greg. Well, I think we've got time for one or maybe two more questions. Um, Pia Grolega is asking about uh, food waste. Do you have any information uh, about what you do um, <laughs> with vegetable leftovers from the market? I'm assuming she means uh, from our farmers markets. Now, uh, do, does Ciro get involved with this kind of thing? I think they are now. As a matter of fact, if you saw the scenario that, that Penn put together, they play, but I think he's dealing more, here's the interesting thing, more with sort of like the big waste that comes from the Chelsea wholesale market, right? The wholesalers where you've got a volume because, and this was interesting, um, when, and, quick story, Brookline, 1979 was a site that wanted to establish a farmer's market uh, after Dorchester and, and South End. Um, their Chamber of Commerce opposed the proposal to establish a market because they feared that it was, they saw the, the farmer's market as being the same as the even hay market. They thought people were gonna come in, sell the stuff, and then there was just gonna be the stuff left behind. The rule of every farmer's market that in the state is you take, it's not so much a rule as it, it, most of the farmers recycle and compost their home stuff anyway, but there is nothing, no waste left behind at the markets. And we're encouraging on-site composting as much as possible as a way to improve their overall economics as well. Greg, I'm gonna um, ask you the last question, I think. Um, what really surprised me was, um, you know, how um, super involved a, a real diverse coalition was at the beginning of all of this. Because, you know, the, the traditional narrative, um, and in some ways it's the dominant narrative is, is, is that this is, you know, white upper middle class folks, but this was a, a really truly a multicultural coalition. Well, why do you think that was? If I could, do, if you want the short answer. Yeah, the short answer. <laughs> Mel King. Yeah. He, he just, there was so much integrity and it was like, and, and he, you could, you could feel and see where he was coming from and the sincerity and he just did it. And, we, we followed, I mean, it, it really was, and I'm not saying it always is one leader, but then I think, you know, in, in mirroring him was sort of the Boston Urban Gardeners and this whole idea, literally of a rainbow coalition. But, but Mel, you have to give him the credit for, for setting that tone. Right, well, Greg, um, 
this conversation will continue and I'm sure our students and our other guests have been energized by this. Can we give uh, Cities at Tufts a warm uh, thank you um, to Greg. Thank you, Greg, very much. Well, and thank you for the, the best questions I've ever gotten. Thank you so much. That's great. Well, so next week, February 24th, we have um, a, a slight difference. We've got our thesis award presentations. Rachel Downey and Megan Morrow um, will be talking about their writing and discovery processes, in addition to sharing the main findings of their innovative mixed methods research projects. And then back to normal colloquia on um, Wednesday, the 3rd of March, with Professor Seth Lowe talking about from spatializing culture to social justice and public space, a journey from research to action. Thank you very much. And again, Greg, thanks so much for your presentation. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.